All right, it's 6.30. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, June 28th study session of the City Council to order all the councils present, including Mayor Brickham, stepped out for a second. Um, so tonight we've got one item on the agenda, which is an uh, update on the Unified Land Use Code that's been working for the last seven months, eight months here, going through fine-tuning stuff. So staff's going to have a presentation. Um, and then uh, we, I know people might have specific questions on specific items, and then let's just let them get through the presentation, and then we can go ahead and ask uh, questions. As this is, you know, I would turn it right over to Kathleen, but this is uh, the interim city manager's final study session as interim city manager. So, so I've been studying up quite a bit on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's been been like I'm an expert, but I'm going to. Kathleen's done too much work in the team, so I'm going to let Doug lead. Turn it right over to Kathleen. I think it's only fair. Thank you, interim. Interim City Manager Doug Stevens. Uh, so good evening, Mayor and members of Council, Kathleen Osher, Community Services Director. So as promised, we're back with a series of fine tunings for the Unified Land Use Code after having roughly, I'll up your seven months to 34 weeks um, that we've been utilizing the ULUC and about four months of detailed line-by-line -line work with Planning Commission and discussion um, so this is all in an effort to try and make our process as predictable and transparent as possible, weed out any inconsistencies, and then to clarify and simplify the experience of using the Unified Land Use Code. So we know that there are going to be future policy discussions, and tonight's focus is really not on policy direction or additions to the ULUC. This is really intended to be to go through a review of um, these refinements and there's no direction requested of council tonight. The intention is really an, an overview and an update on those refinements. So as we've committed to that five-year update to our long range planning here at the city, we know that we are looking at uh, an update to an Envision Littleton type process in 2025. So we know that there are going to be studies um, and other pieces of input that'll help influence policy. So we anticipate that some of those policy discussions will happen prior to that update, but we'll also be setting the stage for some of those to happen when we have that broader community conversation and really think about, I think planning for the city more, more likely on a 30 to 35 year horizon. Um, and you know, this is all about the strategy to sort of manage change, manage growth, and really balance the community character and our shared values, both for the current city as well as the future city, and we think out on that 30 to 35 year horizon. So today we're gonna to start with the basics. We're gonna remind you what the ULUC is, the Unified Land Use Code. Again, we've made a commitment that this is a living, breathing document. It is about managing growth, maintaining that consistency to a small town feel, um, it is the implementation of our 2040 vision, really a focus on what the community wants instead of our 1976 code that was all about what was prohibited. So it is a framework to guide our land use, um, really focused within the borders of Littleton, and hopefully stimulate some private investment that helps bring community benefit to the community as, as a whole. One major change that we have made is now this is an interactive website. So the search capability is drastically improved. Um, we think that that adds a, a lot of opportunity for people to both interact with the code, but also find things incredibly easily. And uh, it's a big chance for you to grow beyond the binder, right, Mike? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it is not it is not intended to be that paper code that, that you have in a binder sitting on a shelf and making sure that you have the most up-to-date version. It is always up-to-date because it functions that way. The just to remind everyone the community input that helped both influence the Unified Land Use Code, but also, do you want me to create a moment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a good way uh, to do that. <laughs> but really uh, captured so much of the information and conversation that we had as part of Envision Littleton. So, you know, looking at that, uh, that aspect of trying to manage our growth really think about community enhancements. Uh, we went through a process of identifying 16 character areas. Um, 
we organize those by building blocks. That's how we orchestrated that conversation in the community is go building block by building block. Uh, we tried to make sure that those were strategically aligned in terms of how they were presented to the community because we know this very significant importance of being able to maintain the strong suburban feel and residential feel in the very heart of the city. So really creating some opportunities for people to think about areas where there might be opportunities to, to manage growth and manage change. So that protection of neighborhoods became a very, very clear theme and message um, with an opportunity to manage growth along key corridors, and namely those being Santa Fe, Broadway, and Littleton Boulevard. Obviously, the historical significance of so many assets in our city um, is something that we tried to blend in with updating the historic preservation code and really eliminating some of those uh, particular challenges that property owners were facing that the code wasn't always the easiest to use and didn't always yield the best results uh, in terms of our shared values and shared goals. So this is um, attempts to be very forward thinking and address our, our housing needs and other community needs, as well as understand um, that blending of our commercial landscape and what is needed to continue to see a thriving business community here in Littleton. So. I think with that, I'd like to introduce my fellow staff members up here. So Jennifer Henninger, Community Development Director, and then Deputy De Community Development Director, Mike Sutherland. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen, and then I know Mike's going to run us through the nitty gritty. Yep. We're going to go, we're going to do a little back and forth here, so you'll hear from both of us. But um, it is important to note, as Kathleen said, we really spent these last few months focusing on the fine tunings or what I would call the, the refinements. So when you update a document, you go from a document that's 40 years old to a brand new document, we're, go we're going to have some of these modifications that we're going to need to do along the way. So we needed to come up with a framework of how we were going to address um, the challenges that we are seeing there on those refinements. And we use this following framework of, does it mitigate risk? Are we assuring transparency? Are we adding predictability with the process? Um, are we establishing consistency, providing clarity? And then as we um, went through with planning commission on that, another framework piece became that improved simplicity. Um, there were a lot of things, and you can see in the red lines that we attached to you, we eliminated a lot of things to clarify and simplify and establish that consistency. So that's really the framework that we took this entire project with. In terms of the priorities for planning commission and staff and something that we emphasized through this whole process was we're focusing on those things, on the refinements, the mitigating risk, and we're not changing any any policy level decisions. And there were quite a few that came up, both as staff has been going through this in the last, what'd you say, 30, 30, 34, 34 weeks, 34 so. weeks that we have been and implementing is. this code. Yes. <laughs> um, plenty of policy level issues have come up. Um, we have a list of those. Uh, and we'll be spending probably the next six months outlining how we want to handle those. Um, and we did do deep dives into very specific language, and you'll see that in our MDP language, um, as well as language with PLO. Um, something to note with those um, items, the PLO and MDP in particular, we really worked very closely with Reed, as well as outside legal counsel with Reed there, um, in refining that language and making sure that we were being legal. <laughs> so. I know I said to wait on questions, Specific to that, can you talk? I think there's a lot of misinformation and misperceptions of what's out there about the, the use of uh, MDPs and PLOs on the, and the kind of the discrepancy in the zoning. Can you can maybe read, I don't know, or you talk about So our next two slides will absolutely help with that question. And if, if you feel like we need further clarification, we absolutely can do that. Is that OK? Great. So with that, we're going to go kind of chapter by chapter of the highlights. So Mike's going to kick us off. Thanks, Jen. So the chapter one is one of the largest chapters of the ULUC, and it's got probably the most changes associated with it. 
the headliner of the changes, I would say, is the, the PLO or plan development overlay. And this issue or this, <clears throat> excuse me, topic has evolved over the course of the drafting of the ULUC and now as we've implemented it in this, uh, this past 34 weeks. PLOs, I think, originally were designed to sunset. And uh, there was some talk as we drafted the PLO, uh, the plan development overlay of getting rid of all plan developments and going to the underlying zone districts. Well, that may not have passed muster with uh, uh, you know, vested property rights that, that are expected and, and relied upon for property owners. So we changed course and instead of having them sunset automatically, they would, there would be an opportunity for a property owner who is in a PD to request moving to the underlying zone district. <clears throat> And as it turned out, that needed clarification as we as we uh, adopted the code and saw the uh, the the changing language and and how it had uh, eventually turned out needed some clarification. So that's what we endeavored to do in in the spirit of having these plan development overlays as. If you're, if you're in the plan development overlay district and you own property within one, that's the rule, is that the previously approved plan development is the zoning document that governs your property. So uh, you have an option to request a master development plan to, to apply the, the underlying zone district to your regulations to your property. And that uh, I, certain developments require master development, large developments require master development plans. But smaller developments, individual parcels, uh, individual buildings can request master development plans. So um, that's a distinction that needed clarification in the code. And we think is consistent with the the direction that the Unified Land, uh, Unified Land Use Code draft was aiming for. And along with that, we've done, uh, and I'll just kind of briefly go through some of the other changes we've, we've gone through with Chapter 1 or some of the clarifications that we've uh, gone through. There was clarifications to the land use matrix. There were, there were areas where tables, uh, we took the, the land use matrix as really the foundational document for land uses. And there were other sections of the code that mentioned land uses that were inconsistent. So we tried to, as much as possible, make other tables consistent with the land use matrix, the main land use matrix of table one. However, there were some, some changes that came about as a result of, uh, of existing developments that did not conform. Um, and you'll see one example is in neighborhood commercial, uh, we should allow mixed use buildings and residential mixed use in there, uh, which Littleton Station on Littleton Boulevard was the, the catalyst for this. They called in and said, well, we can't rent, we're zoned multifamily and we can't rent our commercial space uh, to any users because the use isn't allowed. And so that's one of the two zoning changes that we have. That should have been zoned neighborhood commercial, but was not. And then when we looked at neighborhood commercial, lo and behold, mixed use buildings weren't allowed there. We said, gosh, that's, that's an error we've got to fix. So there's a few changes like that and we vetted all of this in detail with the Planning Commission uh, in multiple study sessions. <clears throat> but uh, uh, let's see, consistency with accessory uses in buildings, uh, including accessory dwelling units. Uh, there, were, there were areas of confusion regarding accessory dwelling units and accessory uses that we've tried to clarify without in our opinion, trying to change policy. We need a, a chance for the new land use code to work. Uh, 
So if we're constantly changing policy directions, that's difficult for property owners, uh, citizens, developers, you name it, and staff. Uh, <clears throat> temporary signage, uh, we discovered through the code that temporary signs weren't allowed downtown. <clears throat> we don't think that's the intent of the, of the sign code and things like that need to be clarified and, and, and allowed, I, I think, you know, like we'd allow in any other district. So uh, as far as signage goes, now we revised that code not that long ago. It include uh, like that ice cream place, whatever it is. That, Andy's? What is it called? Andy's. Andy's. <laughs> you, you go there often enough to know. <laughs> I have a good memory. That's the newest ice cream place. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, it included that as a sign with that ice cream cone on the end. Inside right. of the building, it's actually inside the building. But but, but uh, sandwich signs were something that were controversial years ago. Right. So uh, we're we're not doing away with any of that the sandwich sandwich board type stuff. No, no, and and that is allowed in in several districts and was not allowed downtown. And we thought, gee, temporary signs like that, um, using the old code as a basis. Uh, it seems like that was a, a, a change that staff recommended and, and we saw that needed to be uh, adjusted in this new code. And I think it, kind of an unintended uh, unintended consequence of, of adopting this brand new code, trying to mesh it with the old code. Uh, there are things that occasionally get messed. So that's where we were headed with, with that with that. And then there's more work to be done on the sign code. I won't uh, mince words there. We'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back with, with additional things for the for the sign code in the future. Thank you, Keith. I mean, <laughs> for the signs, we took Simple, yes, commercial I mean. out of some of the neighborhoods. Were the signs taken out too? Remember there were signs in the neighborhoods and now there's oh, yes. no commercial. Was that cleaned up too? What kind of signs? One of the big leaps of the ULUC was uh, a uh, content neutral sign code uh, to adhere with national uh, uh, rulings in the Supreme Court. And yeah, neighborhood signs are are allowed, but they're they're fairly tight. Uh, if you but want if there's to, no commercial neighborhoods, how can commercial signs be allowed? So it's a very small sign area, and uh, I believe it's two square feet, but it's okay. it's content neutral. It wasn't the content, it's just the size of the sign, the, the design and the size. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's... But if there's no commercial... So you could have signs in a non... Yeah. What are the signs for? So... Off-site signs are, are prohibited, and we have interpreted like like the old code that really signs are not allowed for home occupations, other than to advertise the the address. So exterior signs, I believe, are prohibited under home occupations. And we're we're walking the knife's edge on that content neutral, okay, and so trying to get used to it. I understand that. So if there's no commercial in the neighborhoods. How can there be commercial signs in the neighborhoods? Oh, there should be no off-site signage allowed. And really, commercial signs are prohibited in home occupations. So, right, I don't see how there would be commercial signs in neighborhoods. But that was one of the things that was tightened up. Yes. Right. So, like, are you talking, like, house painter? If you need a house painter, call this number. It's just in random neighborhoods. In is that the kind of... Yeah, well, I'm talking about a sign on your like building. On poles, yeah. If you don't allow commercial, yeah, building sign, you know, real estate signs, fine. Right, we've always done right, real right, estate right. signs and that type of thing. But uh, and and garage sale signs, fine. Uh, but you know, I think those banners that people stick in the yard, hey, we'll paint your house, uh, or usually in the right of way. That's uh, where I see them. Code enforcement will pull those. Code compliance will pull those. Yeah. But monument sites to a neighborhood. And yeah, that's uh, that's an area we need to work on a little bit in the sign code. Uh, that is a little bit unclear how we're treating these uh, entry signs, neighborhood entry signs, and and uh, you know even for South Park, there are signs that say 
South Park, not, not commercial, but you're going into a neighborhood. That's an area we probably need a little work on. And we'll kind of muddle why, through. Why do we need to work on it if it's not a problem? Well, it's not completely not clear in the code how those are allowed. So it just needs to be addressed. Yeah. It to be crazy manners. Yeah, but we'll muddle. Th <laughs> I mean, we know they're out there as staff, so we're trying to muddle through on that one until we can do a more substantive fix. Yeah. It's probably fine until somebody puts a big orange monstrosity sign right. for their neighborhood that just kind of is a mess or something. Yeah, I like those little guys that kind of wobble. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, trying to get through 60 minutes, so I'm getting the evil eye here. Uh, <laughs> well, some of this is so detailed, it's hard to go back 10, 12 slides. It's almost easier to do it. Yeah. We, okay, I'll let you do Okay, it. we don't have a lot of content in the slideshow, but we can certainly answer specific questions. Um, let's see. Uh, master development plans is related. Uh, let's go to the next uh, the next piece. This is actually in chapter three, but you can't talk about plan development overlays without talking about master development plans. And in implementing this code over the last several weeks, we discovered that there's a lot of interpretation that goes on with master development plans. Uh, what what's what's the content of these items? How do they work? Um, in reading the code with, with several users and several owners of planned development properties, it seems like there could be two paths to use uh, master development plans. And, and one is a conceptual path where you come to planning commission and <coughs> with, a, with a broad concept and then, and then in the future you do site plans to, to flesh out development within these areas. The other is to do a phase development where one or more phases has basically a site plan that's ready to go. Uh, nobody gets to skip a step. You know, you with a detailed master development plan, you're reviewing a site plan as well. With a, with a conceptual master development plan, you're reviewing a concept, but those folks have to go through site plans at every stage. So we review everything according to the code, but there's there's a couple different ways for people to, to go. And, and uh, having some flexibility uh, for these property owners seems to help. Some people are not ready to do a site plan right off the bat, but would like to uh, utilize the underlying zone district. And uh, that's a way for them to uh, strike a middle ground without skipping any steps. So that's another uh, big area of clarification. And also, we really looked carefully at the um, review criteria for these items. I think we had 13 review criteria initially, and we're talking about adding more. And uh, our council uh, said, you know, 13 review criteria, it's going to be tough for any board to agree on all 13 together, and much less adding another seven or eight to those. What you should do with review criteria is really narrow them down, uh, in council's opinion. And we took that advice to heart. And Planning Commission agreed uh, that it would be better to narrow the criteria down. And so I think we have three review criteria now. So that's a... That's a significant change, and we think those review criteria encompass a lot of the previous review criteria that was there in broader terms. Uh, it still gives uh, the Planning Commission a bit of discretion as to how they view these planning criteria, which I think is not a bad thing. People can disagree on how a, how a particular development meets the review criteria, and that's fine. Um, if it's so black and white that it, you can tell there's no uh, room for agreement or disagreement, you know, if it's just black and white, that should be an administrative process. Really, the, the point of bringing a master development plan to planning commission is that, yeah, there's, there's the, a board can have various opinions on how <coughs> 
a development might meet these review criteria or not. So that is a change that you'll notice in there. Um, you know, really, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, real quick question with regards to uh, the requirements for an MDP. If a project is of two phases or more, how do you guys define phases? I've been trying to scour, uh, sorry, did I poke something? <laughs> you know, it, it, because it can be very subjective in terms of time or size or quantity or type of construction being built, but I wasn't very clear in terms of like walking through definitions if I could figure out what, a, what constituted a single versus multi-phase. Right, uh, so, with phased development, you're planning to build one section before another set of sections or, or another section. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without defining every term we use in the code, uh, it's kind of like the Supreme, we know it when we see it kind of thing. But I think there are some parameters there of a, you know, if you have one or more phases, if you're planning to build the, the whole property out, property line to property line, with one building or two buildings, but you're planning to do them simultaneously, that's not phase development. Really, phase development, we've got an idea for, for one area, and then these other areas of the MDP uh, are subject to conditions in the future which we don't know about. Okay. That's phase development. Okay, so it really is more time bound than anything in the sense that if there is a significant construction period followed by a break, that would constitute the end of a phase, moreover than necessarily types or numbers of building or quantities of anything. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, when you talk commercial development, it's easier to understand. Residential development, they always build in phases. Right. And, uh, yeah, the. You know that's the nature of that business. Is your is particularly large residential developments. You're building a portion of the development while you're setting up for the rest of the site. So, yeah, there's some gray area there. Okay. Great. So, what's the rationale for having the phase? I mean, say you have a development that's in three phases, and taken as a whole, it would not necessarily trigger a master development plan, except for the fact that there's pausing you know, do construction or set something else up. Um, I'm just trying to figure out why is there pause, trigger a master development plan process rather than say, hey, we're going to do this part, you know, it's one small building and then we're going to wait and, you know, do a second part that's another small building and then potentially the whole thing um, would not necessarily hit the criteria that would require MDP. We think the intent of master development plans requiring them was for larger developments. Right. And if if there were a small development where they're going to build one building uh, this year and one building maybe in, you know in a couple of years, you could break that up into two site site plans and that would be fine. And it wouldn't tr necessarily trigger a, a master development plan. Um, but if you've got a larger you know, 10 acre development, you know, we've got those size parameters in there as well. But if you had a larger development that had several phases to it, uh, that was complex. Yeah. You know, that's probably an appropriate development. Right. I'm just, I, I mean, you know, I, I understand that having the, you know, try to catch the very the biggest developments into the master development, that makes sense. But anything that might, you know, any bycatch that might catch other things that wouldn't necessarily need to go that it would just be more onerous. I mean, if it's, if it's, you know, over a hundred thousand square feet or if it's over 10 acres, that's going to get it anyways. And so does, does the phase portion of it, is it impactful? Does it matter? And we may need some future changes. Uh, but and one of the things we, we recommended striking from this was the mixed use development, just because downtown main street, uh, if you built, a uh, a small building there that had, we expect to have retail on the first floor and, and, and maybe some other use office or perhaps residential above. It's a tiny little development. You know, does that really need to go to planning commission? No, and I was glad to see that removed. Yeah. yeah. So we may need some further work on that, but we uh, thought, okay, well, the intent here was phasing and, and let's try and see if we can make that work and have 
larger developments go to planning commission. But we'll have to uh, see how this works with applicants and see if there's some other adjustment we need in the future. I think to your point, like we just don't want to bog down the small projects that could get through it, get, like through a site planning process, rather than having to shove them through the master development plan. And I think if we end up catching those and the, the net was too wide, we can tighten up language eventually, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's an iterative process. Sure. Yeah. This whole implementing a code and making sure we've got it dialed in. One little nit I saw that wasn't taken care of, and it's something that I've talked a lot about, is get, making sure that that goes to, uh, master development plans go to planning pro, uh, commission, so they get a public hearing. It's still on the table, on that on that table ten. What was it? Ten dash nine dash three dash point nine one. The little um, uh, footnote is still there. Oh, 10, 9, interesting. 31. Okay. Yeah. And, and right. people, I know it, the verbiage is okay in the changes you've made. And I know verbiage supersedes tables, but it could be confusing. Uh, yeah, we want to avoid yeah, that. And, and I know we brought that table, corrected table. I've been to trying to get that out of the table for nine months. So, uh, <laughs> we'll make sure that Thank gets you, taken Mike. care of. Are Thank you. Are you referring to table note number four? Is that the one? Uh, the director discretion? Yeah. Yeah, okay. where the director's discretion. Yeah, it's just that little footnote, which you probably want to take that whole footnote out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. There's already a pathway to get there. Yeah. Yeah. What page are you on? Uh, uh, 77. 77. Or 80 of the PDF. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 77 of the one in the, it's right there. Let's see. Hold on. Let me get to it. It's where it says approval for our master development plan. Who can approve it? And it says... Um, that the little footnote says it can go to the plan, uh, to the planning commission at the discretion of the. No, it's crossed out. The four is crossed out there. It just says planning commission makes a decision. Not on mine. It's not crossed out. Mm -hmm. Well, it's Whoa. crossed out. <laughs> is it? I haven't noted. You know, this uh, kind of human endeavors. Uh, you know, yeah. You know, we we vetted these all with planning commission. I, I thought we had changed this table, uh, but then we had to put it all into encode. It may have got messed. So we'll. I yeah, appreciate you. that. Uh, we'll make that correction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's easy to. It's do. page seventy-seven in the one that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think eighty in the PDF. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank appreciate you. It. Boy, I'm long-winded on a couple slides. Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Any <laughs> other questions awful. on MDP or PLO or those modifications that we've made? Awesome. So chapter <clears throat> two, we just had a couple simple um, modifications on this. Um, we modified the language to indicate that there's now an all-inclusive historic district. We had reference to the just the Main Street um, Littleton district. So we cleared that up. Um, and then on signs, um, uh, we clarified and provide transparency regarding the certificate of appropriateness. So if um, you're downtown and you're doing a new signage, um, you do need a certificate of appropriateness. Um, I believe that's from HPB on that. It sounds so Harry Potterish. <laughs> <laughs> the certificate of appropriateness. There we go. Um, so that, that's it for downtown. Any other questions? So on the certificate, like like a sandwich, I'm back to sandwich sign again. That requires a certificate. That's a temporary sign. Okay. And no signs require certificates of appropriate. Only changes to the outside of your building. Right. So signs are excluded from all of that. So nothing on yes, the inside. I didn't say that. Okay. Right. Nothing on the inside. Thank you. Anything else on chapter two? Okay. All right, I get all the fun ones. Uh, <laughs> everybody wants to know about density in the corridor mixed use district, it seems like. And gosh, we need some clarifications on this. Uh, when you look at table 10 3 2.2.1, and I'm going to get used to these, uh, these reference numbers, they're, <laughs> they're kind of all the points and dashes kind of get to you after a while. Uh, <coughs> particularly for, uh, let's say, uh, a mixed-use building, the maximum density allowed is 50 units per acre. 
and then it has a, a second number that's available, which is 85 units per acre, if you meet the sustainability requirements. When you reference the sustainability requirements, it talks about the maximum density bonus you can get is 20% if you do a certain number of things from uh, a list of a menu of options. And even with planner math, we couldn't get to 85 with 20% of 50. It's, you know, we couldn't do it. So <laughs> um, we think the more appropriate number is 60 dwelling units per acre. And this happened a couple times in the code, one with the mixed use uh, building and then the other was that reference from 65 to 62 and I can't remember which uh, building type that is. I'm going to see and, the uh, details uh, on it because I don't have the page number just so yeah. you guys can bring up the table and see what we're doing. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, that was uh, uh, a, it's page just seemed like a, if you in the PDF. 48. 48. <laughs> Okay. It's in the council packet. In the council okay. packet. Please. Yeah, just look at the bottom of the page number at the bottom. Yeah, so the page at the bottom. that seemed like there was a uh, just an error in the code here, but an error that um, is not a Scribner's error, uh, in our opinion. That you know it needed council action for for sure. We looked at that. Uh, and even called the uh, called Kendon Keist or talked to Brett Keist about that. And said, what what was the idea here? Um, and I think trying to stick with the spirit of the code, we also need to clarify whether this is net density or gross density. And uh, net density means you take out streets and parks and and space that isn't buildings, uh, and you get a density based on a, a, a single site or a, a single uh, part of the site that isn't public use. Gross density means you take the entire master development plan and say that, okay, well, 60 units per gross acre means that you could have higher densities in certain areas of the master development plan. And we thought, based on talking with Ken, with Brett Keys, that this was anticipated to some degree that you could have higher densities in some areas, but the gross density would be um, restricted to a either that lower number if you're not using the sustainability standards, or twenty percent more if you are. So it was an area of great confusion for folks who are trying to apply for this. And, and we looked at the, the previous texts of the code, trying to interpret what the intent was and trying to stay with the intent uh, rather than change policies and that type of thing. We thought that uh, 60 units per acre are, are lowering the number to 20% above the above the the base number was the right move but making that a gross density so that higher densities could occur in some areas of an M mdp uh, was what we thought that the intent was so that's the nutshell of of the those changes and clarifications and we hope that uh, we've made a step towards making that a little bit clearer for our citizens and for our property owners of what to expect with that. Mike, can you speak to sustainability requirements? Certainly. Yeah. Uh, so one of the, the big changes from the old code was uh, we need some sort of provisions for sustainability and some uh, benefits to to creating more sustainable development. So the, the option we went with there was a menu of items to, that address sustainability in some, in some regard. And uh, a developer or a property owner had a, a menu list that they could choose from to get both density bonuses and height bonuses and uh, uh, the potential to reduce parking. Uh, sustainability was seen as an important enough endeavor that we wanted to affect uh, 
development in, in a positive way with more sustainable uh, building types, more sustainable design. And that would, the, the benefits for a, for a property owner or development, development company to, to do those would be a, a increases in, in, uh, in height or, or uh, density or, or re re reductions in parking, which can affect- A good incentive uh, similar to like our IHO discussion. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you do this, yeah. we'll be able to do this. I'm droning on a little bit there. Is that what you were looking for? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And where is the menu available for this information uh, outline? Table 101341. Which? Which I thought was in there. Because ah. we didn't make some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is in Chapter 1. Yeah, so the sustainability incentives are in <clears throat> Table 10-1-3.4.1. And they're linked uh, within three. So if you look at there and it says, oh, you know, refer to the sustainability chapter, you click the link and you get right there. And some of those links may not necessarily work in the code changes section, but if you go into the regular code, they work, they work fine. Well, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. I know when I saw those numbers, I was like, wait, what? I don't understand what's going on and how could this potentially impact affordable housing development going forward. We've heard loud and clear, we all know that's what people are asking for, they want to see in the community, and just want to know that that's still protected. Yes, I, I don't think that has any uh, negative effects on um, the intent to allow some greater densities in, in particular areas and to um, really protect the density of, of, you know, the neighborhood core, which we had heard through the process as well. So. Thank you. No, that makes sense. I mean, both Councilmember Miller and I had that question when we emailed him. I think that, so that makes sense. I'm glad to see that it's the, the gross density because that kind of makes sense, the average density of the, the property. So. Um, and uh, each, each section has their own uh, sign requirements, so we we made some clarifications to this section as well for corridor mixed use that seem to bring it more in line with uh, the basis of the old code, and, and it just makes some really basic clarifications there. So uh, that's all I had on chapter three, but those are significant clarifications, I'd say. So on chapter four, is there any other questions on chapter three? Quarter mixed. Okay, awesome. Um, chapter four, neighborhoods. So this is um, creating consistency of the land uses between the land use matrix and our neighborhood lot and building standards. So Mike alluded to this when he was going through chapter one changes. And this is where we saw <coughs> quite a few inconsistencies. So it was really cleaning that up in particular um, having to do with the cottage court community. <clears throat> so it was listed in the use matrix as being allowed use, let me make sure I get this right, um, in medium lot residential. I just want to double check that. It is. Yes. So it was clarifying that <clears throat> in the land use matrix so it was consistent with what was in the neighborhood lot and building standards um, table. So if that numbers, I can tell you which page it is. Is, is this uh, um, coming? Or, or do we have any applications? Any conversation around potential cottages, cottages, cottage communities? Page fifty nine at the bottom. That's where we're. Yeah, here we go. So page 56 and 57 is and the matrix part of it. And then the question is, do we have any current interest or pre-applications? Yes. Okay. Yes, we do. 
Um, and the map that Mike actually just handed out to you all <clears throat> was per the request of the Planning Commission. Um, where could these cottage courts potentially go with the zoning regulations and how they're listed? So everything that you see in pink on this map would be potential locations um, for those cottage court communities. And the other thing we were um, making more consistent was the size of the lot, the density, and how it impacts contextual development. There was some inconsistencies between how chapter one was describing it as opposed to how it was being described in chapter four. So the red lines you see here pertain to that. <laughs> Any questions? What did the Planning Commission, wasn't there concern about certain streets and having it be on the edge of these neighborhoods? I mean, they, they're the ones that asked for this, right? right? It was more of a concern, what is, if I remember correctly, could a cottage court community occur smack dab in the middle of a medium lot residential neighborhood? Like somebody could take a <clears throat> four acre site, you know, a four acre lot and turn it into a cottage court community. And because we have the adjacency requirements with cottage court community, that could not happen. So that's why we did this map to show where those potentials are. And as you can see, it's happening at the edges. If I'm reading this correctly, I'm at kind of county line of Broadway and my neighborhood is MLR and it looks like there could be cottage communities right there. If I'm reading it right. It's on the edge. On the shopping oh, yeah, center. Between Oak Brook. Mm -hmm. okay, that's the Oak Brook shopping center. So that's all surrounded by, you know, um, mid-size residential. It's, it's, it's looks, adjacent to MFR, so. I mean, our neighborhood's all suburban. So it looks like it could all change. So even though it's not in the middle, and I don't know how many other neighborhoods are similar to that. So Councilmember Grove, are those pink areas in your neighborhood, those are open uh, landscaped areas, right? That are owned by the HOA, that long, thin strip that's list shown on the map there, that's right next to Oak, Oak Brook, right? I, I'm in Oak Brook. Yeah. And, uh, and that's MLR. Right. And that long, thin strip shown in, in uh, pink there, that's a landscape area, isn't it? Okay, so I'm on Broadway. Yeah, that long, thin strip is unlikely to become one. Yeah, I, it, but it's I'm having trouble visualizing. It's not saying it can't be done adjacent. To, there's not an exclusion because it's adjacent to what's to the east of it. That would be quarter mix use, right? So yeah. that's why it's adjacent to the IP and the quarter mix use there. That's why it can be used there. We're not saying if it's adjacent to MLR, it can't be done. Right? Right. The cottage that, are, are allowed in MLR. They are allowed SLR in MLR. SLR makes sense, but MLR never agreed with. But hopefully. Because, it, it, like Kathleen said at the beginning, people want to want their neighborhood, the character of their neighborhoods protected. And when you have an MLR or SLR, it's a certain size and certain land. I think you those areas that you see in, in Oak Brook are landscape areas that are happen to qualify because of their zoning, but are owned by the HOA and will never. Yeah, I would think if it's an HOA, they're not going to. The HOA is never going to sell it. They're never going to develop a cottage core. South Park is yeah. medium. Level. This is you know, there's a plot that surrounds me in South Park, but it one's a storm detention pond, the other's an apartment complex. So, right. I mean, I think the potentials. I think the I mean, overall right. indication is an that potential is there, but like the likelihood of it being developed on that parcel is Zero. probably little, little to none on some and of these cases. Cases. Right. I mean, this may be something where we need to Fine clarify some of the details, but looking on yeah. page 59, we talk about where cottage communities, cottage courts, cottage court communities are allowed. And well, I think it makes sense in SLR, but not MLR. It says adjoining or adjacent to MFR, NC, CM, BC, and IP. 
So it doesn't so say it doesn't say MLR in the actual text. Yeah, it's not. It doesn't say on MLR. The chart MLR. It, does. it says it'll, it's allowed, and it was supposed to be on the edge. And I guess this is sort of the edge of it. Although you could, to... yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to think of on county line. There's some pink there that doesn't look on, very much on the edge to me, and some of the edge goes pretty far in. Mm. So what is the, yeah, so in these areas, if it's adjoining the other ones, it can be done, which I think makes sense to me. It's not taking it. Well, so and Planning Commission had a lot of discussion about how big the street was and adjacent and all that kind of stuff. And they they really got down in the weeds on this, is my understanding. Right, so if you look <clears throat> the, on the land use matrix in Chapter 1, so it's permitted with standards. So it has standards. And those standards, that's kind of like the next step. And you need a minimum lot size to be able to do that. So that's another clarification that we have. And then isn't there an adjacent? And, there... and then the adjacency. So like looking at, I mean, this could be something that we can work yeah, with Anthony not on. Within, not yet, yeah. I, only if you had that, that entire there. strip together, I don't even think you would still get to three acres. So you have to have a minimum of three acres. Well, it's a... I think this is more of like a GIS filter that yes. yeah. sort yeah. for yes. a particular... It just seems to me it goes pretty deep into my MLR neighborhood. And... It did not purpose. <laughs> and, and I know when it goes to Planning Commission that they only have a little bit of time before they have to adopt it. I mean, they don't have a really another study session on it, right? Correct. I have a question. Like Middleton High School, for instance, is in pink. Yeah. Right. And Heritage High School is not, but Options is. Because Heritage is not adjacent to any of those adjacency requirements. Correct. Right. So, uh, it would be. And, and Middleton High School is. I think this map is very generous where right. something could so, be. Yeah. But yeah. Like, yeah. That's a long stretch mm -hmm. to turn. Littleton High School into a cottage court? Because at the same time, the Shump property could, is they not. They could, yeah. you know, and that's right. a big close old. it. So if the Shump property is not, but to the north and south, they are. The car dealerships. Why is the, why wouldn't the Shump property be? Because it's corridor mixed. Right. And which, the cottage court is not allowed in corridor mixed. Right. The zoning is different. Uh, in yeah. corridor mixed. It's a change because it was commercial and now it's corridor mixed. So that's the difference. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, maybe could you just look and see how deep that goes in there, and, and just kind of because it, it seems to go pretty deep. It's probably it's, because that one property so. is all connected to this landscape area, and it just happens to qualify because of its zoning and its adjacency to another commercial district. That's Broadway and Mineral is Littleton Hospital. Right. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine a majority of these pink areas don't make sense, wouldn't actually work, but just the fact that they meet the definition of adjoining yeah. in this thing. You and know, that the other pink district. area is in the commercial. Commercial district. So, I mean, imagine. the whole area around my house is, is pink, and yeah. I don't Quality. care. I think that's perfect. I mean, I think it, <laughs> I don't have the concerns. Well, it does it. change the character of the neighborhood. Painting a house bright pink changes the character of a neighborhood. I mean, <laughs> we can get well, but we're looking at character in terms of buildings. In I mean, according to the comp plan, so yeah. it, it. I mean, I guess Littleton Hospital. It's Littleton Hospital, and then there's a park over there. I mean, it's odd that it it could be zoned for cottage court. Well, I go back to, you know, in my neighborhood, right at Prince and Ridge, it's surrounded by small lot houses, and then there's median lot houses. There's apartments and townhomes right there on the southeast corner. And I don't think it's changed the character of the neighborhood. It's, it's housing for people, and it's different, and it's, it's a whole variety. Right there in the corner, it is apartments and townhomes. Right there, right here. Where? Yeah, see, this looks like little. It's right where Littleton Hospital is. 
Yeah, there's. I mean, there's lots. I mean, there's uses on most of these parcels. It's it's just saying there's an overlay of a filter of hey, this is in the zoning that's allowed, and it's adjacent to this. It's not. No. I mean, I bet ninety five percent of this is not gonna would even be someone would even think about doing. I know, but it you the code is also make make it easy for developers and the process easier for staff but it's also to protect the character of the neighborhoods amen and i think that we have to be clear and can't say oh nobody will ever do it we need to protect it with the right code that's my point because you guys may not be here we may not be here in 10 years mm -hmm. and then somebody's going to turn littleton hospital and that beautiful kind of park and area that's right now a hospital into a cottage court community I mean, maybe it's okay, but I don't think that's the nature of the neighborhood. Great, maybe I could afford that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wonder. I, it's in, it's when, in the middle. When we uh, did this exercise of mapping, which planning commission requested, I would have been much more concerned if we saw a bunch of pink dots in the middle of in the middle of. Uh, South Bridge, or you know, in the middle of these white areas that are shown on this map. I agree. I would have been much more concerned, but to me, it does seem like this is edges. I know there's a particular concern in your neighborhood with a with a particular strip, um, but it it does seem to show that that this is possible on the edges, which I think was the intent yeah, of the code to start. And, and I'm not hearing a consensus on the concern. So, I, I mean, I think we I think it's agree. important for me to raise it, even if I am in the right way. I agree. It's fine. It's protected, right? If you're in an ancient right, way. To change and that neighborhood is protected. And Broadway and Mineral is where Safeway is. Isn't that commercial? This is why I'm so confused. And then down south of Mineral on Broadway, that is all commercial. So why are we putting cottage communities in commercial places that are zoned commercial? I, I, something's confusing. <clears throat> and maybe I'm just not reading the map right. Let me double check that. I'd have to see what the zoning districts of those particular. Even if it's zoned commercial right now, you can apply to be able to change the underlying it zone. Probably has to be able to deal with that's over. It seems Don't like we might have some, code. some work to do on this map. Yeah. 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 It, 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 so. I'd appreciate it if you just take yeah. a look and yeah. make sure, because it's all, here's this very commercial area. So something's wrong there. Oh. Right. And then there's a, the area north of Broadway on the east side is all Littleton Hospital. And then my neighborhood is where I live, was right at County Line and Broadway. So when I was in the state, so Cottage Court Community right now is listed in CM as a is, is it, is it uh, allowable? As allowable, PS. And I went to cool. look at tiny houses this week, and they're $100,000 to outfit them. Yeah. So on the northern so, chamber, what, what are those two squares <laughs> 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 On the northern, northern, northern. northern. Oh, northern. Okay. Uh, let's see. Those two squares that are not included. Um, but that residential to the north is right. One of those squares is the northern, the existing uh, uh, school industrial. No, the school should be to the west of that. Oh no! Wait, you're right. That might be the school. That's, north of that's it. where the school yeah. is. Right. So that's it sounds like we do have some work to do on this map. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, I'm yeah. sorry, I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. I just it okay. was an attempt we'll to just to make yeah. sure that we didn't have that scattering of pink dots. Thank you. You know, so I think let, let's go back and, and do that next. That I want to make it very, very clear: these are not proposed or potential projects, right? This Makes is an sense. attempt to see what in the city meets the current definition. Um, so just so that that is super, super clear for all of our guests, as well as anybody that's watching from home. So we'll go back and, and do that next iteration of this map and yep. then share that both with Planning Commission and Council. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, any other questions on four? We already talked about the sign types. So there were no changes to chapter five that we identified in this first round, nor chapter seven. However, we had some minor changes to chapter six, uh, which is the subdivision standards uh, related to deed restriction requirements, uh, which are fairly technical, but relate to subdivision improvement <clears throat> agreements. Um, and I can go into detail on that if you'd like. Uh, chapter eight is historic preservation. And there was some clarification uh, on, the, on when building permits are required with historic alterations. And also addressing some consistencies by removing references to Main Street Historic District, which no longer exists. This was a, a time a factor of adopting the code and then adopting the the downtown historic district. So those are almost um, Scrivener's errors, but we took Scrivener's errors very seriously. <laughs> that is extremely minor corrections. Uh, this one was enough to bring it to city council and make sure that we had the references right. No, I know HPB was very interested on the demo hold, and it was in a previous version, and it was left out of this version. So are we going to get it back in this round? That might be a policy change, that, or would be a policy change. What HPB is asking for is that if there's a landmark building and somebody wants to demolish it, that when they put in their permit, that um, it's an automatic hold so that then you can go talk to the property owner and explain to them that this is a landmark property and look at other considerations before they automatically demolish it. Right now, landmark building, they can get a permit and it could be gone by that afternoon. So I would like to propose that um, council members think about that and the importance of our landmark buildings because once it's gone, it's gone forever that we do do a demolition hold. And if that's a policy change, we could do that in an amendment format. Who, who landmarks it? Who, um, these are landmarked through um, an application process and owners and non-consensual. There's no non-consensual, right? There is. There is? Yes. Okay. There, there wasn't before. There was not before. There's not before. So I would venture to guess at this point one exception we won't talk about, um, all the buildings have been landmarked by the owners. Or like in the case of the post office, the person who runs a post office or whatever. I, yeah. I believe that a, a landmark building that has been approved by council cannot be demolished uh, with a building permit. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a building that's under application. That, that Under is, application for landmark? Right. Mm -hmm. the, that it may not be. It doesn't make sense. That I mean, it's landmark. You can't just correct. Knock down a landmark, landmark building. So, you cannot demolish a landmark building. So what is the, I, I mean, they're very passionate about this issue. So it's just when it's an application that, correct. to me, I think there's something missing in what I'm explaining or understanding mm -hmm. because they, uh, there's not that many applications out there. Correct. No. So. So I thought it was any landmark building. So you're saying it, it's they can't be demolished. Once it is landmarked, they right. can't be demolished. So currently how it is set up, and, and I'll, I'll talk as to perhaps one of the concerns, and we're dealing most likely with non-consensual. So the Canary Barn is something in which we have heard of interest with Historic Littleton regarding the designation of that as a landmark. So one of the challenges we have is we have potentially an owner of said building uh, who may not agree with that designation and is subsequently held up, depending on how your amendment would be phrased, because an application came in designating this as historic. And there is nothing that speaks to how many applications could come in. And continue that hold. So, for example, uh, Councilmember Grove, your home. I could decide to, you know what? 
I think Councilmember Grove's home is historic and file an application right before you're going to do a remodel. Something that you're going to do. You're going to do an addition. You're going to do something. I'm just some creepy neighbor. I want to mess with you. I file an application. And so then it puts a hold on this. And then there's a question from a legal standpoint as to, well, what's to stop another creepy neighbor? I'm using the term creepy. <laughs> well-intentioned well neighbor, intended. great neighbor like Mike Sutherland, to file a subsequent application and continue to hold up an entire development for, I don't know, in perpetuity. forever, in perpetuity, as long well, as you get enough people. it's only 90 days they were asking for, right? That's that But if it's an application, what about another app? put it in, I guess. Only 90 days per building, right? Per application, so everyone else went around and... I mean, that's not the intent. The intent is not to, so can you change it then so that in such a way that the, the intent is not to demolish historic buildings without some thought put into it. They could still do it, but it's it's like we used to have this hold on anything that was a, a, a designated, uh, even on a list. It wasn't it didn't even have to be designated, just to let the property owner know that it's has historical value and to think about it when they do the remodel. That was all it was for. So I wasn't in the meetings. I was there. Okay, so yeah. am I paraphrasing this correctly? I That was an issue of uh, should we bring back that hold on, on uh, properties that may not have been designated or are not in a historic district or not landmark. Should we bring back that hold on, on uh, demolition permits? Um, that, uh, yeah, I think was a, a concern that was raised. I know uh, we had that policy for a while, and uh, it was uh, removed at, at one point, uh, that hold. So, uh, you know, bringing it back, uh, should we do that or not? Uh, did not make it into the ULUC uh, to bring that back, and some members wanted that. And then there's the issue, as Reed was saying, of, okay, an application comes in for a landmark designation, they're rare, but with that hold, uh, uh, I think this happened with Marathon. Um, there was a, I think there was an application to designate some of those buildings that were on Marathon Oil's property. Really? It's it's super fun. So, so, I mean, I hear you yeah. and I agree. It's an important topic to discuss. Um, I don't think right now is the right and part we, to do it, but I do think, we, I mean, maybe at some point in time, because you know, like a study it, session, that it seems he's a little more complicated. going to come back for, what, nine months? No. no. I mean, there's no other time. Morning. Because we're going to adopt this in what August, right? The intention here is and then for the we're refinement done for nine months. So I, I, I would just like to, to consider. I hear what you're saying. That's not the intent. And couldn't that person appeal if somebody kept, you know, putting ap non consensual applications on their property? Couldn't they appeal to through the appeal process? And I mean, you know, <laughs> theoretically, we would, we would have to put in language that you know would. Prohibit the reapplication, if you will, of a property as a landmark um, property for a period of time, but um, that's also prohibiting someone else's rights of making that that application, who may be perhaps a little bit more nuanced in terms of or sophisticated in terms of their application and the rights and the reasons they're giving there for. So. Um, it would require maybe a little bit more thought to it, but I'm, you know, from a legal standpoint, I'm, I'm always sensitive as to a property owner's right to make use of their property versus, um, you know, I don't look at everything as kind of an obstructionist type view, but I, I am thoughtful in terms of, um, are there loopholes in this as it's written to, you know, basically prohibit development in and of itself because someone doesn't like something. 
Well, the intent is. The intent to, is, to but I look at the, the law and what we can do and what we can't do, right. so it's all in the details. Right, so the intent is to make the property owner aware that may not be aware. That would be a well-intentioned intent from some, but that may not be the intent of others. I mean, it sounds like you've had conversations with HPB, and it sounds like, you know, I think the rest of council could probably use some discussion on that and thought about that. I mean, I don't know if we have a meeting with HPB at any time coming up here the next week. Don't currently have a, a joint meeting scheduled, but I, I think because this falls in that policy realm, what we'd like to do is probably come back with a timeline for that because we would be looking to engage HPB in that conversation, yeah. a recommendation, and also engage Planning Commission with a recommendation so that you have those together to know that the, the details have been addressed through those appropriate bodies and then you have um, something to work with here to, to make that decision. Is that something That's that we could look at before we approve these changes? Well, the intention with these changes are the refinements to, to the ULUC. And so because that requires that additional conversation, I think we'd be working with a different timeline. I mean, there is the ability to obviously make an amendment at the our proposed amendment that night, and uh, we can talk through what. I think it would, <laughs> it would be better to do it after some in, fine tuning input from HPB and Planning Commission to hear, you know, their yeah. viewpoint on some of the ups and downs of I mean, it. I think there's a slew of policy changes that all of us might want to approach again in the next round of policy decisions for it, too, I think. This might not be the only policy-related discussion that some of us would right. want to right. bring up I mean, to. I, agree. I mean, I think it's. I think we agree with you. I think maybe the timeline yeah. isn't maybe what you're looking for, but I think we kind of try to make it fit into our calendar and <clears throat> you know go through the appropriate process with HPV and, and planning. Just think, nine months is a long time. Everything is possible. Yeah. Then, then let's look at that timeline. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Yeah, that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on Chapter Six or Chapter Eight? There wasn't much there, but. Thirty-nine. We're getting closer. Chapter Nine. You're over your sixty minutes. Administration. <laughs> it's Mike's fault. Um, <laughs> it's our fault. Really is Mike's questions. <laughs> Our fault for so questions. No, no, these are these are all oh. great questions. Thank you. Um, questions. <laughs> so, uh, chapter nine administrations. The first one was a clarification that HPB recommends to city council. There was a reference in here to planning commission, so we changed that. Um, second one here: mitigate risk with modifications to the abrogation section. Thanks for anyone who can define that for me. I have it up. <laughs> Or do we to read? It's legal. What is abrogation? <laughs> abrogation. I don't remember it. Without abrogation. <laughs> Deal or do away with. There we go. Um, so this really had to do with we added. Um, <clears throat> On what page? But we just basically said that there's conflicts between table, table, contact, or um, table, text, text, anything like that. It's is. Um, Whichever the provision the director interprets imposes the greater restriction. So we added that there because we did have some some conversation with planning commission about that in particular um, table to text, um, and then clarification in the development review summary table. Um, we had a lot of things on appeals, and the appeals weren't going to the right board, so we clarified that. Um, simplify and clarify the process for amendments to the future character and land use map. So there was not a process for that. So we added a process in chapter nine. What um, is that at the highest level to change the future character and the land use map? Who handles that? Well, how, it, what, what's the process? Yeah, it, just at the highest kind of level. How does it work? It's uh, it goes to city council. council. Yeah. It would oh. probably be concurrent with some sort of uh, zoning, zoning change, change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. most likely. Thank you. Um, let me clarify when an abbreviated site plan can be used. So that gets into the smaller sites. Um, if you're making smaller changes, 
So just allowing an abbreviated site plan to take place rather than a full-fledged site plan for something small. Um, and then simplify when and how a zoning certificate is used. So there was some confusion on the difference between a zoning certificate and a waiver. <coughs> and she addressed that in the council questions. So that was that clarification there. So any questions on Chapter 9? Uh, yeah, you do have another slide. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> All right, well, we already talked about some of this, so this is good. Yeah. Um, so the clarification and simplification of the MDP process. One thing that I want to emphasize again is that for our properties that are PLO, if they want to access the underlying zoning that has already been approved by council, they have to go through an MDP process unless you're the little teeny tiny ones, but most everything will have to go through to lift that PLO, will have to go through an MDP process. What if there's a property owner that doesn't want to change anything on their property, doesn't want to develop it, but just wants to just change it to go to the underlying zoning for whatever reason? I don't know why. Selling it? I mean, if the potential in years, like, hey, we want to go through that and sell it, so that, but years off. Right now, the, we have interpreted that they could go to city council through a zone change process and say, well, my property, let's say, is zoned. The underlying zone district is medium lot residential. I am in a PLO, mm -hmm. and I want to go to city council and request that the, the current zoning of MLR PLO be changed to MLR on my one property and city council could consider, you know, planning commission would have a decision. We do the full hearing process with all the notice and city council can make the final decision. Is there any conflict since it is, there is underlying zoning to that. So it's not really a rezone. It's, it's, a, yeah. a it would be a event. zone, uh, a, an official change to the zoning. Okay. Similar to a rezone. Yeah. Similar. But, but uh, with this, the, you know, the, that MDP process would be available to them. I'm, well. I'm just trying to think of loopholes or th not necessarily loopholes, but things that maybe right. wouldn't make sense, but that someone might try to do that it, common sense might say, okay, so suppose. <laughs> and I, I think that that's, you know, in the course of the 34 weeks that we everyone's been utilizing the code. We're 35 trying to, soon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, or 36, right? Like, but um, so, you know, we've been trying to, to essentially identify all of those. Same point. Um, and, you know, to kind of use your term of loopholes, right, as as we see more of those or see issues with those, that's, you that's know, this, game. again, right. living document, right? And when it needs to be addressed, that's when we'll be back in front of whichever body needs to weigh in. If it's something with the HP code, then starting with HPB, moving to Planning Commission, and then ultimately to City Council. So um, we're... we're I try to identify all of them um, and have what we feel like is the the first most important set of refinements. But it's like some software releases with patches every couple. Yes, that's a great analogy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great every three four weeks, the windows. So you're stuff. looking for the loopholes. Like I get the question about Littleton it's Village. Better, one point. If somebody it's wants better. to lift the PD on their property, is there going to be a high rise in the middle of the, you know, where there's now two story houses or whatever? Well, just because you're lifting the PD doesn't necessarily right. change the underlying zoning. So you'd still but be able to see the yeah. underlying yeah. zoning. So they'd be okay because that would be yeah. small right. MLR, and SLR, whatever. already decided on that underlying zoning. zoning. So right. that would be, right. in Kyle's example, the request is to go to the underlying zoning. So it, yeah. it protects them. Yeah. But looking for loopholes is good. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and anyway, I mean, just because we did the code doesn't mean that we're still not going to get a rezoning request. Thank you. So, um, then consistency with engineering standards on access permits. So we really had our engineers go through this. So got that all clarified. Um, we also compared this with our international building codes and had our building go through that. So we did a lot of clarification when it um, comes to the board, uh, the building code. Um, then clarification on which board hears what type of administrative decision. We already covered that. Um, and then that waiver request process. Um, mm -hmm. We really defined that. And there was nothing in chapter 10. 
So I'm trying, interestingly, and it's tough to say interestingly at an hour and a half in, but uh, the word usage section, or what most people call definitions, was one of the stickiest, trickiest pieces in going through the detailed um, work with planning commission. And changing definitions uh, has broad effects, you know. <laughs> so uh, just a, a synopsis of it. We tried to remove definitions that weren't used any place in the ULUC. Uh, there are several of those, and this is probably the process of drafting and editing and changing as we went through. There are concepts that uh, we had originally discussed in the ULUC that dropped out or something changed, and, and we're stuck, we're left with a definition that doesn't have any regulations associated with it. So, kind of a house cleaning item there. We added definitions for uses that were listed like a recreation center had no definition and, and uh, uh, probably more famously the Bomar Recreation Center was uh, a case that came in and uh, you know it was a land use table change and it was also a need to define these these not uh, commercial recreation centers but neighborhood recreation centers that were you know there's five or six of those that are in in Littleton. So we wanted to make sure that those remain here. They're expected to be here. Uh, also, we wanted to provide consistency between the ULUC and the building codes. And this is where things got sticky. So the planning commission has, uh, uh, we went through each definition and compared it with the building code. And, and our initial thought was let's be consistent between the two. The Planning Commission has such a great background of, of individuals who have, you know, architecture, building uh, degrees, things like that. And they're very familiar, and they steered us in uh, in different directions on this. Maybe in, in terms of height, uh, which we had suggested, maybe we should make these two consistent. Let's have the building code change to match what the zoning code is. That's a policy change, and, and we talked about that with Planning Commission, but um, structure, half-story, we're still kind of wrestling with those. Half-story in particular was a, a, a very difficult uh, definition to wrap our heads around, uh, both the way it was and the way it's proposed. Uh, there's a lot of different thoughts on this, and it's an important concept because uh, some buildings are limited to a story and a half. For example, detached accessory dwelling units have to be a story and a half. And so the current definition limited to half of the floor area of the building below it. Well, if you've got a, you know, think of a carriage house and you've got a two car garage Nobody wants to build half of that floor area above the garage. What you're really talking about is inside, you know, the, there's a roof and smaller walls that are, that are on top of the, the garage and you're living under that roof and, and part of your interior space is angled. You know, the, the ceiling is angled to some degree, bless you. Um, so we were, we struggled with that, and I think we've got a definition that works, um, but still may need some refinements in the future. But things like that were uh, were really uh, chewed very carefully before they were swallowed. And when you say <laughs> building codes, are you referring to the twenty twenty one IBC? Twenty twenty one. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, so any any sort of reconciliation. <laughs> that we would anticipate that, you know, we'll cover those. Okay. Um, so at the end of July, we'll be back with council to talk about where we are with the, the ICODs and that process. So we'll make sure to highlight anything there. But the goal is to, so that they will match in each of the codes. Yes. We, and the last thing you want is discrepancy between a definition. Yes. We're going to have to make a bunch of changes after we adopt the new building code. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why that timeline was adjusted. Yes. 
Uh, ADU types, I, I think we there were various references throughout the code from uh, internal and contained, and we picked one. I think it was contained, uh, and tried to get rid of all the other uh, definition, you know, all the other references to internal ADUs. Uh, that type of thing uh, was part of this this section, and then consistent language for cottage courts. Uh, in general, through the ULUC process, we try to avoid regulating through the definitions, which is annoying for everyone, uh, staff, citizens, everyone. Oh, you got to look at the definition. That's where you find the regulations. We try to avoid that. Can't say we completely got away from it, but that was the effort. Um, also with the slide, you will see two zoning corrections, zoning map corrections uh, that we didn't have a, oh, do we, do we have that? I do not. Uh, I referenced these earlier. CenturyLink on Mineral, uh, they had requested through the initial process to go to the from the commercial mix to the <coughs> commercial. Still fits within the broad land use category, but uh, they had requested that and uh, we weren't able to do it then, but we thought this is, might be the time to, to, uh, to tackle that. It was intended back then. Also, Littleton Station on Littleton Boulevard, I kind of went into the details of that, and that just seemed to be a mistake, that um, it was zoned multifamily, uh, and the owner called us up for a business license, and I shouldn't, I, I just, I sympathize with the owner greatly, and we tried everything we could, but uh, with the zoning of multifamily, you know, we said, well, some of these uses aren't allowed there, uh, but we worked very carefully with them and, and very closely with them to uh, say, you know, we put this in front of the planning commission. We've got a schedule to go to city council. I said, I would, uh, I think this is non-controversial. I'll uh, kind of put it out there and, and I'll sign off on, on uh, business licenses for your existing commercial spaces. Just, uh, is an unfortunate error. Where's the cross street of the motion station? This is right, this right here. Yeah. Spots so he where wants to make it all residential. No, it, it's zoned residential it's right zone now. Residential. Yeah. It's, it's, it's mixed use it's right now. Use. They do have commercial. They right. do have was commercial. An accident. And they were so trying to renew the leases. It was an accident. This should not space. have been zoned MFR. It should have been. Well, it shouldn't have been zoned. I was on planning commission. That was clearly commercial. This was during, yeah, during, yeah. Clearly. And it just, I think when, we went through this process. Uh, uh, the consultants, in looking at that particular piece, said, "Oh, wow! That's we see all the different apartments that are there. We're going to make that multifamily, and we just didn't catch it, catch it. Um, in time to get it oh, to no, council. Okay. Okay. So, just a mistake." Yeah. Uh, and and the other one you're talking about the was Century Lake. Century Lake. Yeah. And that's yeah. going from That's going mix from to... commercial mix to neighborhood commercial. Which part? This uh, one over here? Yeah. No, no, it's the, it's the big, big middle thing. Yeah. Right yeah. there. Yeah. The yeah. 40 yeah. acre plot. Yeah. Right so it's mineral. not yeah. It's all that. Yeah. What's the difference between those two? Oh. So uh, you know, probably it's the intensity of uses. The the uh, CenturyLink or Lumen requested this, and uh, I believe they may have the property on the market, and uh, thought there was an advantage to having a neighborhood commercial, which still fits within the the character area. So, you know, we didn't see a, a harm in going. From Maybe commercial mix to neighborhood commercial. commercial. I think yeah. that's what their intention was. Right. Does that fall under the business district? Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. No. No. It's Are separate from referring the referring to South Park. Yeah. Not in. So they've been out for a while, right? It's not. No. Well, I mean, it's, it's in South Park. It's, it's just been part physically of the South Park right. business district. Right. We did a tour of it not all that long ago. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. And now it's empty. Now it's empty. Excuse me, it went from. That's a big. Yeah. It's going from IP to to BC, excuse me. Yeah, it has that mixed up. 
I need a bath. <laughs> <Don't get laughs> this one. Yeah. 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 Need some more acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The only side that we had left was just the timeline, and we've already really discussed that with um, July 11th. We're going to Planning Commission, and then we'll be back to you in August. So you're not going to HPV before you come back to us? Any other questions? Kind of went through those. And then July 26th is when we're back to talk about the I codes. Just so that the what codes? International the international, international codes. codes. That's July 26th? July 26th, yes. Okay. Is that it? No questions? Dude. Fantastic questions. And just a plug for our planning commission. They have been amazing to work with and they have spent a lot of time um, on these fine tuning. So big shout out to them for all the work on this. They, are they doing and a retreat this year? And read too. Read did a lot. Just <laughs> 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 come from. So with the, with the planning commission, Even uh, they got their public hearings. So there's not going to be any changes right now necessarily. Big changes, except for a few of the typos, uh, right? Map stuff. There are yeah. no alternations. Okay, alternations. Yeah. When did they do the retreat? Planning commission. Yeah. Have they already done? They don't. They do don't do a retreat. retreat. They don't do no. retreats anymore. No, no. they used yeah. to. They got yeah. big work done. What has they been fun too, right? <laughs> it's a, uh, it's yeah. been a lot of nights. <laughs> back on, <laughs> back on topic here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The uh, the website, and I believe really the fact that there was you know public comments on changes here. Had there been a whole lot with that, and they, I'm assuming most of it had been incorporated. And just because the public are coming on things doesn't mean they're being incorporated if they don't make sense necessarily. Uh, there have been several comments, and we're, we're informed of those, and then all the comments will be forwarded to the Planning Commission and the okay. City Council. Not quite as many as you might expect, though. I'd say we're in the teens right now, mm -hmm. so it's not as many as, as you might expect. And well, I'd say most of those comments are really more policy-level future yeah. discussions. Right, and that's we anticipate the, the number of comments to grow dramatically when we have some of those policy discussions both with if it's HPB planning commission or city council. In theory, these changes aren't controversial. Right. 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 Because again, or you know, go back to that just clarity and clean up. making sure that the experience of using it makes sense. It's easy. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you for letting us ask questions along the way because it was. Yep. Saving it up with <laughs> Does the interim city manager have any update? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy. He should be the city manager. Does the oh, attorney have any update? No, that's tonight. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks 93 for, minutes in, we're adjourned. We're wearing uh, 87.